Oh boy, do we have a fun question here. Uh, definitely a long question, so I'm just going to dive right in. The statement is, analyze the case of the polarization perpendicular to the plane of incidence. Impose the boundary conditions uh, listed by equation 9.101 and obtain the Fresnel or Fresnel equations for E eps or tilde E naught R and tilde E naught T. Sketch the ratio of R and I and T and I as a function of theta I. For the case of beta equal N2 over N1 equal 1.5, show that there is no Brewster angle for any N1 and N2 and that uh, tilde E naught R is never zero. Confirm that your Fresnel equation is reduced to the proper forms at normal incidence. Compute the reflection and transmission coefficients and check that they add up to one. Okay, busy, busy, but I don't think anything's going to scare us. Um, we just got to be very careful with how we set everything up. So our boundary conditions are equal to such. Okay, clearly here the fields have to be Epsilon 1 and Epsilon 2 for transmitted incident reflected happen on the same side. Again, it's all Z directions. Here, your Bs need to add up across since they don't really change. Uh, everything else in X, Y doesn't change. And the B and X and Y change from one material to the other. The law of reflection and refraction, Snell's law and stuff. The angle of incident equals the angle of refraction. And sine theta t over sine theta i is equal to n1 over n2. Break that down into c over v1, c over v2, and that gives us v2 over v1. All right, why do we do that? Let's dive in. So our solution, we break down all these equations. So we have the electric field incident, the magnetic field incident, the reflections, and the transmis transmissions for the perpendicular incidents. Um... Take a go, go ahead and take a moment to digest this because it's quite a bit um, moving in. We have incident in the Y hat, reflected in the Y hat, transmitted in the Y hat for the E fields, all with different uh, K vectors. For the B fields, we're some combination of X and Z, some combination of X and Z, again, minus signs on the X's. And then transmission, we have the minus sign on theta 2. So uh, we just need to be careful with everything. And uh, let's go ahead and have a quick note here that'll speed things up. At z equals zero, ki dot r minus omega t is equal to kr dot r minus omega t is equal to kt dot r minus omega t. So we can drop all the exponential factors in applying the boundary conditions. Okay, again at z equals zero. That's what we're looking at. Um, and if we look, and for that, we use the last problem that we just did to showcase this. Um, so the arguments have to equal, and the coefficients have, have to sum to equal one. The left hand coefficients have to sum to equal the right hand coefficient. Okay, there we go. All right, let's go ahead and uh, drive this home. Since the polarization is perpendicular to the plane, the electric field is in the y direction. Okay, so the boundary condition 1 yields epsilon 1 times 0 is equal to epsilon naught times 0 and 0 equals 0. Good to go there. No worries. All right, but 3 says that we have, um, uh, excuse me, yeah, 3 says that we have x and y. So now we just need to incorporate the fact that our x component is 0, but our y component isn't. So we have all the coefficients here. Thus showing that we have the tilde E naught I plus tilde E naught R equal tilde E naught T. Pretty expected, I would say. Now for the magnetic part, boundary condition 2. Uh, we have the uh, V1, E1, and theta 1. V1, uh, ER, theta 1, and V2, E, e of T, E naught T, and theta 2. Whew. Okay, let's factor out the theta 1s and the V1s. And we're left with uh, the I and R coefficients inside the bracket. Similarly, theta 2 and V2. Uh, push that all over. And we see here that uh, we get the uh, E not I and E not R is equal to V1 over V2 times sine theta 2 sine theta 1. Which, of course, as we know from the law of reflection or was it refraction or refraction, excuse me. That that's equal to V2 over V1. 
So let's cancel. And we see again that we reduce to E not E not I plus E not R equal E not T. All right, cool. Finally, the boundary condition four says, now we gotta be a little more careful doing the same thing. We had some negative signs to cancel on both sides. We factor out the uh, v, V1 and the cosine one on the left-hand side to the mu one fraction. Similarly, we have the cosine two, theta two, and the V2. Push it all out, divide through, we get epsilon, or the um, E naught I minus E naught R is equal to this big fraction here. Mu one, V1, cosine two, mu two, V2, cosine one. Uh, we can split that up a little bit more and we can get the mu one, V1, mu two, V2 um, by itself. And if we let alpha equal the cosine fraction and beta equal the uh, mu one, V1 fraction, then we see that we get a pretty similar um, boundary condition where we have E naught I minus E naught R is equal to alpha beta E naught T. Okay. Okay, a pain, oh, whatever. From these boundary conditions, however, add these two equations to solve for E naught R and E naught T. Okay, so what we have here is, um, okay, so the two unique equations where we have the plus of E naught I and E naught R, we add them together. We see that the R terms cancel and we can factor out a, a T term. And so you see we get two on the left-hand side and a one plus alpha beta on the right-hand side. If we solve this for E naught T, we get a two over some argument. So again, there goes that form again. One plus alpha beta E naught uh, I. And if uh, we substitute this into the equation, either one of them, we see that we have E naught I plus E naught R is equal to uh, 2 over 1 plus alpha beta E naught I, solve the same for E naught R. Then we get a minus sign on the inside of that fraction just because we factored out the E naught I's. And if we find a common denominator, what we see here is that uh, we get a 1 minus uh, alpha beta over 1 plus alpha beta. Again, this form looks familiar. Good to go there. So we have the reflection coefficient or the uh, amplitude as a function of some coefficient times the incident amplitude, and the same for the transmission. Since alpha and beta are positive, it follows that 2 over 1 plus alpha beta is positive, and hence the transmitted wave is in phase with the incident wave. And the real amplitudes are related by just drop the tildes, because if you remember the uh, tilde allowed us to have a complex amplitude uh, with the phase difference, but since they're both positive, we don't have a negative there to flip it, which would flip the sine or cosine, giving us the negative. So we're fine. The reflected wave is in phase if alpha beta is less than 1. Note that we have a 1 minus alpha beta, so if it's less than 1, it's in phase. And 180, 180 degrees out of phase if alpha beta is greater than 2 or alpha beta is greater than 1, because then you would have a negative sign in there. And so the negative would flip the signs on the cosine and um yeah, the cosine, which gives us a negative, um, since we want the real part. Um, so, yeah, so we see that the amplitudes are related by the absolute value there. Um, just a little note for that. These are the uh, Fresnel equations for polarized perpendicular to the plane of incidence. To graph this, uh, let's go ahead and be a little careful. We have alpha beta is equal to beta so cosine theta 2 over cosine theta 1. Use Pythagorean identity to put the... Uh, sine term in there. We know the sine uh, squared term can be from the law of refraction. And um, so we just f push that through. Now that we have a, a square root here, we can push that uh, in 1 over in 2 is equal to 1 over beta squared. Um, once we square it all, excuse me, is 1 over beta square of both of them. Now push that beta from outside to inside, hence the beta squared in the numerator inside the square root. Distribute, and what we see is that alpha beta is equal to the square root of beta squared minus sine squared uh, theta 1 over cosine theta 1. So both of these are dealing with the same cos or same angle, theta 1 equals theta i in this case. And now we can, um, so here we see that theta 1 is the angle of incidence, whatever. Uh, beta was given at 1.5. And so we see that we have alpha beta is equal to 2.5 minus sine squared theta i over cosine theta i. Okay.
we can graph that pretty quickly. Uh, let me scroll over to the graph. Okay, so a couple things to see here on this graph, uh, done in Desmos because it's easy. We know that the sum has to go to one, so that's gonna happen at some point. Um, clearly, pi over two seems to be that way. They intersect at 1.014, um, which is halfway between the two. We see that we have the ratio of reflected in green, ratio of transmission in uh, blue. So as the angle of incident increases to 90 degrees, we uh, get all, reflecting, all reflection as uh, we split closer to zero degrees. These are done in radians. I have another one in um, degree mode for later. Uh, as we scooch back closer to zero, we kind of split them two. Um, so we have reflection is 0 0.2, transmission is 0 0.8, they are the same at uh, 1.164 radians. Um, but yeah, pretty cool graph. Uh, let's get back to the Brewster angle, though. Um, so is there a Brewster's angle? Well, epsilon or E not R equals 0 would mean that alpha beta equal 1. Okay, if we go back to um, the ratios that we had uh, from the second equation with the absolute value. So yeah, that would say that alpha beta equal one and hence that the alpha um, at square root thing that we made earlier is equal to one over beta uh, once it simplifies down. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, let that key compile through. And what we see is that uh, that uh, equal one over beta is equal to mu two V two over mu one V one simplify this all through after you square both sides and uh, move the cosine over what we see is that one minus uh yeah one minus the v squared or v2 over v1 squared sine squared theta one is equal to mu2 v2 over mu1 v2 v1 excuse me squared cosine squared theta whoo we got a lot dealing with that um, so put the sine and cosines on one side, factor out the V2 over V1 squared. We see that uh, we get a bracket with the sine squared and cosine squared. Um, and we're going to say that, that is approximately equal to V2 over V1 squared, since mu1 is approximately equal to mu2. Hence, uh, that uh, ratio on the cosine term goes to approximately 1, and then we can use Pythagorean identity again. So with that, this is only true for optically indistinguishable media, in which case there is, of course, no reflection, but there would be true of any angle, not just a special Brewster's angle. If, M, if mu2 were substantially different from mu1, and the relative velocities were just right, it would be possible to get a Brewster's angle for this case at uh, v1 over v2 squared equal 1 minus cosine squared, theta 1 uh, plus the mu one mu 2 over mu 1 squared cosine theta cosine squared theta 1 because we just took that sine squared and um, put in the cosine squared from Pythagorean identity factor at the cosine squared and maneuver accordingly we see that if we solve for this thing uh, very carefully replacing the v1 with the mu mu and epsilons and then divvying them up accordingly from the squares and the minus sign after we reduce the fractions. Uh, we can see that the cosine squared theta 1 is equal to another fraction. But this media would be very peculiar. By the same token, because uh, we have the ratio of epsilon 2 and mu 1 and mu 2 across the board. Um, but anyways, by the same token... Delta R is either always zero or always pi for any given interface. It does not switch over as you change theta one and the way it does for polarization in the plane of incidence. In particular, if beta is equal to three halves, then at alpha beta is greater than one for, um, for then we plug in what we found for alpha beta has to be greater than one. And we solve that 2.4, 2.4, 2, 5 minus sine squared theta 1 is greater than cosine squared theta i. And if we plug it through, we see that 2.25 2. is greater than sine squared plus cosine squared, which is equal to 1. 
So yes, in general, for beta greater than 1, alpha beta greater than 1, and hence, uh, delta r is equal to pi. Again, we saw how that was reflected across, so we expect that for beta less than 1, alpha beta less than 1, and hence, uh, delta r is less than zero is equal to 0. Okay. So for at normal incident, alpha equal 1, so the Fresnel equation is reduced to um, T equal 2 over 1 plus beta uh, E of I, E naught I, and then E naught R is equal to 1 minus beta over 1 plus beta, E naught I, exactly what we expect. The reflection and transmission coefficients take the complex conjugate, or square them, of course, and we see that we get uh, 1 minus alpha beta, 1 plus alpha beta squared, Similarly, transmission, alpha beta equal, or alpha beta uh, times 2 over 1 plus alpha beta squared. Add them together, uh, find a common denominator, add them across, of course. Factor them, simplify the numerator, simplify the numerator by factoring, and we see that they cancel, and we do get r plus t equal 1. Whew, long question. Um, very in-depth, though, and uh, those graphs you will definitely see again, so... Let's take a break from this for a little while and re, uh, rejoin here soon.